There are so many things we can do today. Operate by heart, by long distance. Clone sheep. Even the entire human genome has been decoded. Thanks to the web, we seem less stupid as we combine all of our knowledge from the four corners of the world. You can hold global meetings remotely while following the live tweets that recount the overthrow of Gaddafi. In just three clicks, one can see the village of Obama's grandmother. Right there. It may not be that interesting, but it can be done. Nowadays, you can also take a nap at 300 kilometers an hour. And it should be added that our life expectancy keeps growing by an average of three months every year. And yet there is at least one thing in our lives that is not improving, that doesn't work. It's something you're probably experiencing right now. It's about to leave you. You're both depressed and angry. You're haunted by the wastefulness of it. A breakup as unexpected as it is premature. This is the moment of truth. So be honest. Oh, television, why do you want to leave me? Have you been programmed for this? You want to stop me watching the investigation, don't you? When a device is built so that it lasts only a few years, forcing you to buy another, that's known as planned obsolescence. In theory, the question is simple. Does your washing machine, your microwave, your refrigerator, your vacuum cleaner, coffee machine or mobile phone have a part? That's broken. In ten years' time, harmony will reign everywhere. Maybe. Do our devices contain one or more fragile components deliberately inserted by the designers to shorten their lives? The simple fact the question is asked is enough to trigger the wrath of the manufacturers. It's a myth, they scream. Yet another conspiracy theory to add to all the others. So we wanted to know if this planned obsolescence really exists or not, or whether it was made up by militant environmentalists angered by rabid consumerism. I think it is a trend in the way that the equipment is built, that it is not built to be repaired should it fail. It's built to be replaced. Et pour ce faire, donc, uh, and to do so, it's necessary to create what's called programmed obsolescence. In other words, to play up the quality of the object in order to sell it and then make it appear obsolete or close to it once it's been sold. The main preoccupation of any commercial salesman is to sell a maximum of his goods at maximum profit. So we find ourselves oversaturated with objects of all kind. It's therefore unclear how, if these objects had been built to last, how this whole system could work. Let's stop throwing stuff out. The manufacturer can produce better objects that can last for longer, even if the price is higher. Impossible. So you would think it a good idea to investigate all sorts of electronic appliances. We chose just a few, and even so, we were soon loaded down. But our little tour of the industrial world has shown that planned obsolescence is often a little more complex than a simple broken part. Damn. One thing is certain, manufacturers who do it use our passion for shopping and our insatiable need to keep buying things. Take, for example, the old cathode ray tubes, your old TV. Like millions of others for the transition to digital terrestrial broadcasting, you put it in the trash. It was too old, too fat. Instead, in your living room, you've installed a brand new flat screen. Yes, the picture is better, so is the sound, and the design is trendier. In the meantime, our desire for better and smarter objects has led to the doubling of sales of flat-screen TVs since they were introduced in the mid-2000s. But basically, your old TV worked very well and would last far longer. According to this recent study by the 60 Million Consumers Association, compared with cathode ray TV sets, the passage of time is cruel to LCD and plasma sets, i.e. flat-screens. They age faster, 
terms of brightness, 40% less in just two years, and also in terms of colors. How can an object that's full of technology be less durable than the big old TV set? In the small shop in Paris, such as few exist anymore, there's all kinds of stuff. In these drawers, small, multicolored parts, electronic components, resistors, diodes, capacitors, the vital organs of our flat screens. Oh, that's a bad sign. With the soldering iron are two electronic experts, Alex Alal Rimbaud and Francois Bichy. How can I help you? This lady is here to have her TV's electronic card repaired. What brand of TV is that? Samsung, right? Now, the usual problem, it's the capacitors. It's like a car tire. Once it's punctured, it's too late. A few minutes later, another e-card lands on the counter. What is this? It's a TV card. And what kind of TV? It's a plasma, or LCD. Well, it's a Samsung. Same problem. A Samsung TV, again. Alex seems blasé about it. What is going on with Samsung? Well, there was a power surge, and a few months later it broke down. So, it's the capacitor, apparently. Ah, the capacitors. This is one of the culprits, the swollen and cracked cylinder, what French technicians call a cauliflower, a capacitor with a puncture. And the TV won't come on. Does this happen often? Oh, I'd say anywhere between five and ten times a day. Given the high demand for this product, we stock it by the thousand. Paris would seem to be in the grip of an epidemic of broken capacitors. Another customer has the same problem. His TV is just three years old. Did you bring it back to where you bought it? Oh, yes, but it was 200 euros just to take it in for repair and for a quote. And on the forum, they say they deliberately use capacitors that will break down quickly. Anyway, I bought another one in the meantime. You bought another what? Oh, yeah. Well, that's programmed obsolescence to limit its lifespan by fiddling with the voltage. It'll fade away much quicker. Aha, so it's done on purpose. But how? Well, all manufacturers are right on the edge. On the edge of what? Well, why put in a much larger component that will cost a lot more? And when it's fine for two years, that's enough. That's being on the edge. The minimum. Everyone's got their opinions, don't they, Francois? Samsung is the most popular because it's the cheapest. And they're the cheapest because the manufacturers use cheap components. We decide to leave a chart in the store where customers can write the brand, how old the TV is, and why it broke down. Two weeks later, we return to the shop and wait in line, like everyone else, before interviewing Alex Alal Rambo, who's as much in demand as ever. Alex Alal Rambo, clap. We left you a chart. Here it is. Not every customer filled out the form, but there are 18 who did. You can see it's the same fault. Capacitors that swell up and need changing. And it's always the same brands. Yes, well, out of 18, there is one LG and the rest are all Samsung. Among the flat screens, which are those that break down the most often? Well, very often it's Samsung, there's LG and Toshiba sometimes. Well, it can be any brand really, but mostly it's Samsung. There are a lot of returns and a lot of maintenance for this brand. So looking at our chart again, it would seem that the average age of a television that was broken down is three and a half years old. That's not very old, is, is it? Well, actually, in this day and age, three and a half years is not bad, actually. Do you think it's good? Well, yes. Anyway, it evolves very quickly. The new technology makes you want smaller, flatter, and inevitably, it makes it overheat. And the hotter it gets, the hotter the capacitors. You said there are a lot of customers who buy capacitors. You sell 20 a day? What do you think people who don't come to see you do with their old TV sets? Well, unfortunately, they end up being recycled, thrown out. Because to get the power board replaced at the store or by Samsung costs 280 euros. 
For this? Yes, for the card. And what do you charge? 21 euros. So they just throw out their TVs? Or they're forced to buy another because most dealers say it's not worth the cost of repairing. Throw away and buy again. All because of those damned capacitors. In Samsung's case, they would appear to have a short lifespan. At this point, it's impossible to know whether Samsung is deliberately programming it this way. After all, it is the market leader, so perhaps it's to be expected that there will be more cases of failure. But one thing is certain, what happens in Paris is true for all of France. Well, this is a workshop that specializes in flat screens. In the Ardèche region of southeast France, Francis Delafoy runs a flat screen repair service. He's the head of a network of 600 independent specialists based all over France. He's gathered together all the defective components from across the country and has mapped each complaint. Now, you ask your network throughout the country to track recurrent problems, and what they've sent you are mainly issues with capacitors, most of them involving LG and Samsung. That's it, yes, and it's not just one model. Wherever it is in France, in the north, the south, the east or west, it's exactly the same fault. These are recurring failures at a national level. With information collected from his network, Francis Delafoy sums up four regions in France. No capacitor failure reported for some major brands of TVs. On the other hand, the majority of faults with LG and Samsung are due to capacitors. For Samsung, it's between 50 and 85% of failures, which is a lot. When the TV is on, it heats up. The lifespan of the capacitors depends on the heat. Here, for example, a list of four more or less reliable capacitors. At 85 degrees centigrade, model one will last 2,000 hours. The second, at 105 degrees centigrade, 1,000 hours. So it's a fragile model. The third model, 2,000 hours, and a tougher one, 5,000 hours, still at 105 degrees centigrade. The hotter it gets inside a television, the less resistant the capacitor. What it means in a product, in this case a flat screen, is that if it's unfortunately enclosed or the temperature in both the room and inside the unit is high, or if there's no interior fan, well, that will shorten its life. And at that point, the set will just stop working. Especially if the screen has been aesthetically placed in a wall or near a radiator, as it will heat up even more. But it does depend on the manufacturer and where they've situated the capacitors inside the flat screen. Because the interior is a maze packed with components. It overheats, sometimes right behind the screen. At Compiègne, near Paris, we meet up with Nicolas Patin. The job of this lecturer and researcher is coaxing the condensers to prevent them from aging too quickly inside the TVs. Because in the field of electronics, the capacitor is not known for its stamina. So this is a power supply board from the Samsung flat screen. It's marked on top, right there, you see? It takes the expert's trained eye to spot a problem straight away. You see here, the capacitors have been placed near a radiator, so the components close to it heat up. And that means that they will wear down more quickly than if they'd been placed a little further away. The radiator is this large grey metal piece. Its role is to take the heat from the diodes that have been attached on top and dissipate it. The hot air escapes through the sides of the radiator and also through the other side, exactly where the capacitors are. Which is true, but heat, remember, is their weak point. So the moral of the story is capacitors on certain models of flat-screen Samsungs, like this one, are too close to the radiator. Of course, all manufacturers will tell you you can't just put a capacitor any old place on an electronic circuit board. They need to be not too far from the components, nor too near the radiators. But why then do Samsung's capacitors fail so often? Were they made to break down so quickly? Are they programmed? You'd probably want to ask Samsung that question, wouldn't you? But calling the director of group communications in France, all we get is a voicemail box. Yes, hello, Florence Cattell. This is Elise Lucet from France 2 Television. I'm ringing because we'd really like to interview a senior executive, such as the marketing manager or the vice president of Samsung France, for example. 
While we wait for the communication office to get back in touch, our investigation continues. On the table are some of the now useless Samsung capacitors from workshops we've visited. They cost only 16 euro cents a piece. It's the cheapest on the market. Couldn't Samsung install capacitors that are a little more expensive, but would last longer? These are all the capacitors we've found. Nicolas Patin, the electromechanical researcher, wants to show us that there are far more resistant capacitors with the same technical characteristics. This range still works at up to 150 degrees, with an operational time of 27 and a half thousand hours at 105 degrees centigrade. 27 and a half thousand hours, five times longer than the capacitor Samsung is using. And here's a slightly larger component. Its diameter is 16 millimeters and it's three centimeters long. So the equivalent would be a, a little larger than, than this brand. A little larger by a few millimeters and also more expensive at around four euros a piece. Four euros instead of 16 cents for a lifespan that's five times longer. So the price of durability is quite high. But maybe it's not that high. Not that high indeed. If they make their components larger, it may cost a little more. But it's really about selling less of their products. But the aim of a manufacturer is not to sell a TV every 20 or 30 years. The electronic equipment inside is generally designed to have a reasonable lifespan for the consumer and also to satisfy the manufacturer. So if 10 more or less fragile capacitors in a TV set were replaced by bigger and tougher versions, you could estimate that we'd get a TV that works five times as long and costs just 50 euros more. My dear lady, wouldn't you want to have a TV that lasts five times longer for just an extra 50 euros? Oh, I certainly would. Precisely because when we buy our nice flat screen Samsung for 400 euros, we don't suspect that it will give up the ghost quite so quickly. But on the other side of the Atlantic, in the United States in 2012, the news shows were filled with reports like these. Does your TV take a lot of time to power up? If you own a Samsung, you're not alone. Tonight, Samsung is admitting that millions of its flat screen televisions may have problems that cause them to just shut down. Millions of Samsungs that fail to work, and the same scenes as in Europe. Dozens of TV sets in repair shops, all with the same capacitor problem. So people need to know that this can be fixed. Absolutely. They don't have to throw out the TV. Absolutely. It's it's exactly the same thing as in France and elsewhere in Europe, the same brand with the same characteristics. Except that in the US, consumers ganged together and brought a class action suit against the global TV brand leader, Samsung. The problems are so massive, class action lawsuits have been filed in three states. Late today, we uncovered documents showing more than seven and a half million people could have defective TVs. Seven and a half million Americans found themselves with broken down TV sets. The brand offers an amicable settlement and says it will pay repairs to the tune of $300 per set. U.S. courts have approved the agreement. In a statement, Samsung said that these problems affected only 1% of its total sales in the United States. But the figure is very difficult to verify. On both sides of the Atlantic, we all have the same question. Did Samsung executives deliberately decide to limit the lifetime of some of their flat screens? Did they use poor quality capacitors and did they place them near the radiator so they'd heat up faster? Is that why they shut down? Or on the contrary, did Samsung just want to keep costs down and has no hidden agenda? In his workshop on the street corner, Alex has his own thoughts about that. 
Samsung, Samsung originally chose to make an electronic board card with cheap capacitors, right? Agreed. But the problem is that they also need to compete in the market. To get the best value for money, you need to reduce the purchase price of capacitors. Well, the impression I have is that Samsung has a real interest in using capacitors that will quickly overheat and explode, just to sell more flat screens. It's true, we've seen a lot of Samsungs come in with problems, but is that a design error? I mean, anyone can make mistakes, I do. Or is it deliberate? That's the big question mark. Do you agree, though, that there are other manufacturers that, well, they have to be careful. If they want, in a way, to see a lot of return goods, wouldn't that also prove negative for them? I mean, I have friends who say, no, I won't buy a Samsung now. So they shouldn't head off too far in that direction. So they, they're taking risks. Oh, yes, they're taking risks, but in the new range, and we're seeing the cards also starting to come back in, they've changed their policy. Oh, really? How? Well, they've moved the capacitors further away from the heat dissipators, so they stay cooler, and, and this time they've made sure people like me can't fix this problem. Because what they've done is design a new capacitor that can't be bought anywhere on the market. So that means even if you're a, a repair expert, you're excluded. You can no longer repair the circuit boards. We will no longer be able to repair the circuit boards of the next generation of ultra-slim screens. So then for once, we really will need to buy a new TV. Uh, yep. So the old capacitors don't last long, but they can be changed. The new ones would be more robust. They have an unusual shape, more elongated. But now they're impossible to replace. That's a lot of unfortunate coincidences, don't you think? Our first requests for an interview with Samsung have come to nothing. Allez, parti. So we start again. Hi, I'm somewhere I can't take your call right now, but please do leave a message after the train. Thank you. Hey, yes, hello, Florence Cattell. It's Elise Lucet again from France 2 Television. I really would like you to call us back, even if it's just to tell us that you don't want to do an interview, if that's the case. And apparently, it is the case, as Samson's head of communications is only on her voicemail. Florence Cattell is not available. Please leave your message after the tone. Yes, hello, Florence Cattell. It's Elise Lucet phoning you up again. Do you know if Florence Cattell is in Paris or in France? Well, she should be here as far as I know. I can pass on the message and I'm sure they'll return your call. Goodbye. We ended up being seriously worried. Where is Samson's head of communications, Florence Cattell? Is she lost in the rainforest? Has she been kidnapped? Where is she hiding? In the desert? The North Pole? The only message we've received from her was this text. Hello, sorry for not getting back to you sooner, but unfortunately, we'll not be able to respond to your request for an interview on innovation. As hard as it is to believe, there exists in France no completed independent study on the evolution of the lifespan of major household items. The only known survey was conducted by the Jafam Group. According to the study, published in 2011, the durability of our products has barely fallen in 30 years. Refrigerators, washing machines in 2010, as in 1979, last for an average of 10 years. You can be the judge of just how independent Jafam really is. Jifam is a trade association that promotes the interests of Bosch, Brandt, Candy and Siemens. We have a better cleaning program. Oh yes, and LG and Samsung too. In fact, all of the major brands, large and small. Hello, Mr. Plank. How is it that after 30 years, manufacturers have still not managed to make longer-lasting fridges or washing machines? We asked for clarification from Bernard Planck, the managing director of GFAM. In this day and age, there's remote surgery. We talk to anyone from anywhere all the time. We can send emails around the world. But we haven't managed to make something as simple as a fridge last longer. 
Well, you'd think we could increase the lifespan of appliances like that. But this study shows us a second possibility that, in fact, the use of such appliances has increased dramatically. No, but that's to be expected. And frankly, when you see the new technology that's around today, look, 25% of households use their washing machines almost every day. Yes, but it's not that obvious because people reported using it 8% more. It's not that much. Refrigerators, 11% more. That's not much either. Your argument that they use more doesn't really stand up, does it? Because ultimately, the appliance's lifespan is not longer. Yes, uh, these are statements from people who say 8%. Uh, uh, do you mind? Can I... Uh... Oh, please, they are your papers. Well, it's a matter of people's perceptions. A lot... Uh, let me just check the numbers. Let me uh, have a look through it. Oh, go, go ahead, it's yours. There we go, a fridge is used far more frequently now than 15 years ago. And let's look at the whole document. In fact, the households that say they've used stuff more often aren't that many. It's 8% here, 11% there, 8% here again. It's not much. Well, you know, when you say it doesn't last longer, because they use more frequently, well, it's not really the case, is it? Well, it is a factor, but, listen, I can't tell you, uh, because your theory is that new technology should mean the appliances should last longer. Well, thanks to new technology. Well, thanks to new technology. Well, yeah, but the survey we did showed that nearly 75% of consumers are satisfied with the duration of their equipment. 75% of people are satisfied. The only trouble is, there's no such figure in the study. And besides, there's another problem. The TNS Software's polling institute, which carried out the study, based it on the findings of a survey from 1977, which was made public in 1979 and commissioned even then by Chifan. This old study serves as the point of comparison with the 2010 results, which is how Chifan can conclude that the lifespan of our equipment has not diminished. Worryingly, however, there is no trace of the old survey. All that survives is a very small paragraph in an old GFAN publication. So how credible, in fact, is the current survey, which was in the press last year, praising the reliability of products, which is based on a now vanished and therefore unverifiable study? Even TNS Sofres carries a health warning under the results table. Having only a part of the results of the study conducted in 1979, it says, we cannot determine whether the difference is significant or not. When you make a comparison, it's obviously important to have the point of reference. So we looked for the 1977 survey. Yes, I know, but unfortunately I don't have that study. It was 30 years ago. But, so you made a comparison with a study that you don't have. Well, we have the results, which Sofres have validated. No, I'm sorry, but all of this is based on just three small lines here, which is all that remains of the 1977 study. Nothing more. Look, the study we conducted is an analysis of the time values of the appliances in 2012. But you made a comparative study between 1979 and 2012. It's here, I can show you. No, no wait, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm a bit like Colombo the detective, am I, with all my papers. But at the same time, I'm not an expert as you are on these documents. Now, we agree, don't we, that you have the amount of time they were used in 1979 and in 2010. So you need to have a reference here. But we do have the reference. It's a study, as I've told you, but it doesn't exist anymore. You told us yourself you don't have it. We have the results. We conducted the study. I no longer have the documents, the actual questionnaires, uh, because that was 32 years ago. I'm sorry, I wasn't there at the time. You can't blame me for that, surely. No, no, not at all. It's just the starting point for the study doesn't really exist anymore. What I can tell you is that this study is real. It exists, and we wouldn't invent one study just to publish another. Okay, well, let's just move on then. Listen, I'm not happy at all, because this isn't how you said this interview would be. And we're just trying to get some answers. No, 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 it's not how you presented it. And if I knew it would be like this, I would not have come. I'm very unhappy. I'm going. No, Mr. Planck, wait, please. Uh, we're investigating the lifespan of appliances. It's natural that I asked them to give me all the questions before, but we never do that. 
Well, you, you never do. Well, all right, fine. We don't do that. Well, we don't do that for anyone, whether it's the president of the republic. It's nothing against you. No, it's always the same. No, I'm sorry. I've had enough. We really want to allow you to speak. And that's how to shorten the lifespan of an interview. In the meantime, if GIFAM finds its 1979 study, we would know whether or not its 2011 study on the lifespan of products is reliable or not. Fragile components that break down too quickly. An inconvenient leak about the limited lifetime of a computer. A lack of reliable statistical data. Obsolescence, more or less subtly programmed, comes in many forms. In recent years, a new trend is emerging, making repairs of a product impossible or very difficult. The goal of a major brand is to ensure that there is no more competition. In other words, to create a captive market. So how do you create a captive market? First, by making this product incompatible with those of the competition. Now, Apple has done that. And secondly, by preventing repairability, which more or less forces the consumer to move on to the object's next generation. So that's one way major brands capture value. But only the big brands can do that, since you need to be able to dominate the market. A little lesson in modern economy. Even if it means making something irreparable, so long as everyone buys it. An object the public cannot do without, something that's become an essential part of life. Look no further than the end of your arm, a mobile phone. The key to its obsolescence, its battery. Apple, the world's coolest company, initiated the fashion for the built-in battery. Before making it standard in its mythical iPhone, Apple learnt this with the iPod, the MP3 player it released in 2001. Boom. That's iPod. <laughs> But a New York artist, Casey Neistat, discovers, after 18 months of use, the battery in his iPod is dead, and it can't be changed. He shoots a video seen by thousands on the internet. Welcome to the Apple Care Service and Support Line. Casey takes his revenge by daubing the walls of Manhattan with this slogan. The non-replaceable battery in the iPod only lasts 18 months. What follows is a class action complaint filed by a group of American consumers. Tonight in the show's biz, iPod battery backlash. Over 12,000 people filed a class action lawsuit against the company because they said the battery just wasn't up to snuff. The complaint. The battery had too short a life and was too expensive to replace. Apple pays $15 million in purchase vouchers and changes the batteries of more than a million plaintiffs. Everyone is happy. Then, here we go again, this time for the iPhone, launched in 2007 amid mass hysteria. A phone and an internet communicator. This is one device, and we are calling it iPhone. But nobody is perfect. The battery can still not be replaced. Apple strikes again. This lawyer is the first to attack the company's racket. Harvey Rosenfield stirs up a hornet's nest and sends Steve Jobs an offensive letter. We urge you to prominently disclose the actual battery replacement cost and replacement process in order to ensure that no consumers are misled. I'm always, you know, as a consumer advocate, I'm always amazed at what consumers will tolerate. Harvey Rosenfield will never receive a response from Apple. Nor will the journalists who ask the same question. Why doesn't the iPhone have a removable battery? We obtained these internal Apple emails, which take a wicked pleasure using a smiley emoticon to respond with a no comment. In response, two lawyers file a suit against Apple again. And again, the company avoids going to trial and offers to negotiate with the plaintiffs. Did Apple and AT&T pay money to the plaintiffs? Yeah, Apple and uh, AT&T settled the case. That's all I could tell you because it's confidential. But most of the time, the settlements, uh, it's like they pay money. That is correct. A conventional transaction 
The company avoids a trial by paying off the plaintiffs. This method doesn't always work, however, especially with MJ, a former employee of Apple. MJ trained the assistants in Apple stores, the brand's boutiques. Today, she is highly critical of her former employer's methods. So you were not happy there? I was almost the entire time um, until I started asking questions like that and I started being a little more persistent. Uh, but then I would ask some of our managers and um, some of the people that were in, like, in-store leadership. And uh, it didn't take long for me to realize that I wasn't actually going to get any answers. It was just this cyclical conversation where I would say, I think it's silly that we can't replace the battery. And they'd say, yeah, well, and then repeat the same things they've always been repeating. So it was like talking to a brick wall eventually. MJ now works for a smaller company, which she prefers. It's called iFixit. A merry band of troublemakers who repair things. The engineers at iFixit have their own manifesto. How to fix everything, oneself included, and their emblem is the fist and wrench. On their website, they provide free repair manuals, and they sell tools or parts, which is how they earn their living. To see what's wrong, they open up the devices and take pictures from every angle. Their guide tells you how to change the battery of the first iPhone. It's something they make clear is very difficult. It's a completely ridiculous design. Demonstration by MJ and Kyle Weens, her boss. It just makes me, I never thought I'd say this, but miss when I was carrying a Blackberry because it was so easy to get in and take the battery out. You could carry like three extra batteries with you if you right. wanted. Yeah. Yeah, finally, I got this little piece of it off. Okay, so that's where the <laughs> antennas are. Um, now, you'd think that it would be straightforward, like I've even got some screws here, but no, you have to pop the metal tabs on the sides and that's gonna take me another half hour of filling. Yep. So this is the battery. And this is uh, the solder connections here. So if you want to replace it, you have to... Learn to solder. <laughs> <laughs> right. Get the soldering equipment. Yeah. In the next iPhone model, the battery will no longer be welded, but glued fast to the bottom of the hull. A nightmare to change. And in the latest model, the 4S, the battery is screwed into the machine. But still no lid, so you still can't change it. For Kyle, the role of the irreplaceable battery is obvious. That premature death clock that they're building into it by building in a consumable is designed to increase the number of iPhones Apple sells by making them last less long. And that is how a bunch of kids in flip-flops, barely 30 years of age, are standing up against the global giant of information technology. On one side, electric drills and screwdrivers and on the other, the most massive profits in the history of electronics. With each new iPhone, Apple changes the technical specs to ensure the battery is well enclosed. And every time, iFixit manages to undo their work. Hi, I'm MJ with iFixit, and today I'm talking about Apple's insidious plan to sabotage our iPhones. At the beginning of last year, MJ caused a stir on the iFixit site with this scoop. On either side of the dock, people bringing their iPhone 4 into the Apple store for repair have found their Phillips screws have been unceremoniously swapped with the Apple five-pointed screws in an effort to keep people out of their iPhones. Bloggers and commenters alike are referring to these special five-pointed screws as security torque screws, and it's making me crazy. Apple has quietly totally changed the screws on its iPhone 4. This one on the right has slightly more rounded ones than the one on the left. So now it's impossible to open the iPhone 4. Will iFix admit defeat? Not a bit of it. Including a new product that I'm very excited about, our iPhone 4 Liberation Kit. A freedom kit for the iPhone, available for 7 euros with a pentalobe screwdriver, two standard screws to replace the nasty ones modified by Apple, and a conventional screwdriver that comes with it to open it up again later. The cheapest way we could find to remove the tamper-resistant screws, an Apple-certified repair technician to take out a couple of that. MJ is proud of her secret weapon, but when the video was released, her former colleagues at Apple weren't overly impressed. They call me a traitor. <laughs> 
as if I'm being disloyal to my country or something. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Um, and, and they just kept repeating all the same things that they had been saying. Well, the screws are there to keep people out because we don't people are hurting themselves. And it's like, you can't really believe that. Attacking Apple is blasphemy, an act of treason. Except, and you may have noticed, everyone here works on Mac or has Apple products. A bit contradictory, no? I love Apple. We use all Apple products. I think it's great. Apple has made a lot of repairable products, and we, we uh, really encourage that when we see it. But what we've seen in the marketplace is that uh, the harder that you make a device to repair, the fewer things get fixed, and the less long something lasts on average. And so we're trying to do everything we can to reverse that cycle. Reverse the trend to pollute less. It's always the same story. As we said at the beginning, it's to reduce the tons of waste. This is one of the true motivations of MJ, Kyle and the gang. Computers, monitors, hard drives of all brands, all obsolete. Kyle went to Ghana himself to shoot this video. Today, apparently, there's not much to say. Apple keeps its customers informed. The happy owners of an iPhone know exactly what they're buying. Except on the Apple website, you need to look hard to find the information indicated in a small inset on the right. We see the optimal service life of the battery is 400 cycles, or 400 recharges. And to replace it, another three clicks away, it costs 75 euros in France, $79 in the United States. Quite a hefty price. If you're not aware that iFixit sells new batteries for 20 euros each and you don't have the patience to dismantle your smartphone yourself, chances are you'd go directly to the Apple store. And this is what you'd be told by the Apple assistant, something we filmed with a hidden camera. You got an iPhone 4 on a contract, two year contract with AT&T, $99. To replace the battery here, $79. So for $20 more you'd get an iPhone 4. What do you advise me? So if I were you, I would, do the, I would get a, a Ford for $20 more. If your battery is dead, change your phone. Ten years ago, you would have screamed. And now you think it's completely normal. For example, look at this happy customer who's just forked out $500 for the new Apple iPad. Show me your iPad too. He had the previous model, but he broke it after just five months. The price of repairing an object compared to buying a new one has come under the microscope of France's Environmental and Energy Conservation Agency. What they've found is the consumer is willing to pay for repairs if it costs less than a third of the new device. Below this threshold, repair is systematic. Between 33 and 50% of the price of a new object, then 10% of people are still prepared to have their device fixed. Over 50% of the cost is extremely rare. Figures that will probably not have escaped Apple's attention. Especially since, according to another survey by an association of American consumers, battery failure is one of the main reasons we change phones. That damned battery crystallizes Apple's planned obsolescence. In fact, people change their mobile phones every two years in the United States, every 22 months, in fact. And in France, it's every two and a half years, a cycle of a little over 30 months. It's worth making a call to Apple France but the press officer shatters any illusion about getting in. Have you heard anything back from Apple? No, the answer is no, which doesn't surprise me. Did they say why? They never allow filming on our premises. Never? No. You never give interviews to the media? No. Being a press officer at Apple looks easy. All you do is say no. We decide to try our luck at Apple headquarters near San Francisco at Cupertino, a small town in Silicon Valley. 
You might think we're totally obsessed with Apple, but we just want some answers, and we're not the only ones. Look, these are the Raging Grannies, a group of international activists. They've demonstrated against nuclear power, against the war in Iraq, and now they want to take a big bite out of the apple. How much is the cost of obsolescence? The upgrades and replacements and such. How much when you don't support your products? Don't help the world much. One more time. Apple, Apple, you can't hide. We have seen your greedy sights. Their plan is always focused on profits. If we plan in obsolescence, we will make more money down the road. That's that's what they want. How much for that gas? The raging grannies show up every month at the Apple store close to the company's headquarters. We have time to kick back a little. For three months now, all our calls and interview requests have all been turned down. The company seems to be everywhere. In our lives, our computers, our phones, the news, the stock market. But as soon as we want to ask some real questions, there's no one available. So we focused on the famous Infinite Loop, Apple's headquarters, and attempt to approach employees in the parking lot. You know why the battery is not removable on the iPhone? I don't have any idea. You work here? I'm actually not allowed to speak to any things like that, unfortunately. Uh, uh, do you work here in Apple? Uh, I do work at Apple, yeah. Yeah. Do you know why the battery is not removable uh, on the iPhone? I have uh, no idea. I'm not allowed. You don't work about uh, on iPhones? I can't answer that question either. As soon as we arrive at the main entrance, we're immediately stopped. She is the press secretary. And the muscle man behind her is from security. We don't allow uh, filming on campus. Oh, okay. So you'll have to shut down the camera. But I um, just wanted to know what you guys are kind of looking for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Anna Salzberg. And uh, uh, just have to shut off the camera. Sir. We would like to ask some questions about the iPhone and especially why the battery is not removable. You know, the best bet would be to reach. I can give you some um, email information as, uh, for our European PR folks. Um, and they can best direct your request. Um, unfortunately, we aren't able to offer an, an interview today. And as you know, we don't do a ton of interviews. I'm sure you... Yeah, yeah. Why you didn't reply to my email? Why you I didn't want to answer sorry. my question? You know, I don't know. We're such a... You know, I have no idea. Do you don't have an appointment then, unfortunately? You can try to call someone. Please try. I, I give you my phone. No. <laughs> no, we do have to go through the, pro you know, yeah, the, the yeah, proper, so the proper route. Yeah, the proper well, I try to, to, to make it through the proper way. It not... doesn't really serve anyone any good. The thing is, I, what I don't understand is that the battery is... You, 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 you explain you, that. You made it. We're clear. We get that. Got it. We got Completely that. Completely understand. You don't have to repeat that. We got that. Got it. Okay. So what we're letting you know is what our action plan is. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, do you work here? Yes. Yeah? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I, we don't do it. I, I, I would I like to know why the battery is not removable. Are, are, and we are trying to answer. We're going to have to ask you. We don't, you know, you, you, you can't interview our employees. Yeah. Our employees. They're not spokespeople here. Yeah. That's not appropriate, and this is our campus. Yeah, I, but how how should I do? You're going to you know, I'm going to, I, I, yeah. I told you Alan's going to help you out. We're going to have to ask you to leave now. That's not great at all. It's all to no avail. Our questions slide off the press officer like a touchscreen. And we're kindly requested to vacate the premises. Siri is an application. If you don't have it, you're completely out of touch. Finished. A has-been. Use Siri and you'll be a winner. Beautiful, handsome, with muscles. You'll have a big family, a real job. You'll finally be happy. Reply. Siri gives you a sense of power. You can use your voice to tell your phone what to do. Should I take an umbrella with me today? Two out of three ads for the latest 4S promote this feature. The iPhone is the only one to have it, and it's the principal selling point. Shame Siri doesn't work on your old phone. Which is surely why sales of the iPhone 4S have smashed all records. When it came out, 4 million were sold in just three days, more than twice the sales of the previous iPhone, barely a year earlier. Madness. Except that some took it as a challenge. In Canada, for example. 
Ryan is a hacker well known in the pirate fraternity. He managed to install Siri on his iPad. How many calories in a bagel? This might answer your question. And also on his old iPhone, the iPhone 4. Call home. Calling home. Home. According to Apple, Siri is supposed to work only on the iPhone 4S. But Siri existed before on the iPhone 3GS and 4. But one day, Apple sends out a message. I've been replaced. The new Siri is even smarter and better looking than me. I'm waiting for you on the iPhone 4S. Except that the phone doesn't have much to do with whether Siri works or not. All the recognition is occurring on a server somewhere, not on the device. So the device is just getting the data from the mic, bundling it up, and then uploading it. All of the hard work happens somewhere else. That's a MacBook Air 2011. First iPad, iPad 2, first iPhone. We can safely say that Sebastian Page loves Apple products. The Frenchman who settled in California set up a blog dedicated to the brand and its iPhones. <laughs> I clean them every time. He's even built a shrine for them. We asked Sebastian Page to test the difference in response times of Siri. On the left, the hacked iPhone 4, and on the right, the 4S. Here's the weather for today. Forecast for today through this Monday. Send a message to my wife, Send a message saying, to my wife this saying this is a this test. Is a test. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'll send your message. Okay, I'll send your message. Okay. Only one or two yeah. seconds difference. Siri works in much the same way on both models, proof that Apple could do it as well. I find it a little mean as a sales technique, but Apple is a company that must answer to its shareholders every year. And it has to generate revenue and profit, so any means is good. In a large house not far from Chicago, Siri has a sense of humor as well. Here's a guy that loves to play with Siri. Siri, tell me a joke. Nothing unusual with that as Dag Kitlaus is the application's inventor. I don't really know any good jokes. None, in fact. Come on, Siri. Tell me a joke. Two iPhones walk into a bar. I forget the rest. Siri earned Dag Kitlaus millions of dollars the day Apple bought his app. What are you wearing? Why do people keep asking me this? <laughs> the Apple not only bought Siri, but also the entire company and its employees. That was in 2010. Dag stayed with Apple for 18 more months until he recently Looks resigned. Like Will Dag answer all my questions? I can tell you about traffic or maps. Yeah, way off the mark there, Siri. The interview with this former Apple employee might prove touchy, as we want to know why Siri is not on all iPhones. Ask Apple what they, why they made the decision. No, but you were there, you know. Of course, but I can't talk about decisions that were made when I was working at Apple. Why? Because we have confidentiality. Mm, Siri is working on all the devices like iPhone 4 and 3GS and even on iPad. It's working very well. It's not working that well. It's not working as well as it works on I, Apple. Come on, one second, the difference, what is it? What's next? We ask him again, and this time, hopefully, he'll answer the question. Oh, but the fact is that it forced people to buy a new phone. Yeah. It's true. And is it voluntary done to, to do that? to push people to buy a new one. I think lots of companies like to have new features on new products. That's normal. I think we've covered this. Siri answers a lot of questions, but not necessarily the most important ones. Can one imagine a world where obsolescence is not the rule, but the exception? 
And here's the stupid question. Couldn't manufacturers write the life expectancy of their appliances on a label? Could they extend the lifespan a little or at least allow us to fix it without spending a fortune? It's a matter of reducing pollution as well. As for us, will we ever be less spellbound by every technological innovation? A little less dependent on our frantic urge to shop? And is anyone trying to develop an application to answer all these questions? Are you a